By looking at what internet companies replaced, you can get a better idea on what blockchains will replace. Although we can't compare the internet to blockchain one to one, having this historical perspective as a long-term crypto investor is useful to build the confidence and the conviction to hold your assets through ups and downs in the market. So we're all very familiar with the internet. The internet made communication and sharing of information very easy. It was the democratization of information. If we take a closer look, what actually were the first use cases of internet companies that disrupted the existing non-internet companies? Here is a summary of the top internet companies that were founded during the dot-com boom and are still operating today. These were the very first use cases of the internet, Web 1.0. At this point, social media and mobile had not yet arrived. Looking at these companies, we can summarize the use cases broadly into three top areas general communication, commerce, and entertainment. So we can see that some use cases are more served than the rest. This could mean demand from the market for these use cases was bigger at the time. And when you think about it, we can see these use cases made big changes to our lives. Before online entertainment, you had to go down to Blockbuster to rent a video, or go to your friend's house and play on a tabletop. Now, you could explore a massive fantasy world without ever taking a step. Before online commerce, there were shopping malls, garage sales, bookstores. You had to physically go down to the shop. Now you could choose from a huge selection of products without ever leaving your house. Before email and chat, there was mail, telephone and voicemail. People were actually trained to leave voicemails and fax to be more time efficient and you had to concentrate on a single message to complete it. Email sped this up to near instant communication. Now you could communicate with anyone in the world at the touch of your fingertips. Before search engines, there were libraries, encyclopedias, and books. You had to physically go to the library and go through books to find what you were looking for. Now you can learn about anything you want from a never-ending resource of information. Wow, you know, we never really take the time to stop and appreciate the internet, but damn, the internet is f***ing amazing. We also see here that we are incredibly lazy and we will always choose the option that is the fastest with the least amount of energy spent. In every single case, we see that the internet was used to boost efficiency. So, now that we have this perspective, do we think that blockchain will also be used to boost efficiency? And... Efficiency of what, exactly? Again, we can't compare blockchain to the internet one-to-one, -one, but we can make very good educated guesses here. Let's go back to first principles of what a blockchain network essentially does, and see if it does the same thing as the internet. Blockchain networks are similar to the internet in that they both use protocols. These protocols specify how information should be collected, validated, and transferred throughout the network. A useful story to understand blockchain is to understand the Byzantine general's problem. This story explains what the consensus mechanism in blockchains fundamentally aimed to solve. If you know this story, you can skip this segment. Imagine a general and three lieutenants, each positioned and ready to attack on the north, east, south, and western sides of a city. Before the attack, they want to scout the defenses and come up with a plan. The plan must be synchronized. The majority must agree on either attacking or retreating at the same time, if they are to have a long and successful career in attacking cities. But to do this, they face a couple of problems. They are separated by distance, so they need to send messengers to communicate, who may be killed or become traitors along the way. Each of them view the city's defenses from different angles. They each do not get a full view of the city, but they must come to an agreement on whether the city is attackable or not. And each of them may also turn into traitors themselves and become untruthful about the situation. So given these problems, how does the majority come to an agreement on a synchronized plan? Well, let's say at the beginning they all agree to retreat if there isn't a majority decision as a failsafe. The general first thinks they should attack and sends a message to all the tenants to attack the next day. 
Three messengers then get on their horses and start riding. Using cryptography here would mean their messages between each other are cryptographically secured. So if the defending city captured a messenger, they cannot understand the message. So let's say here, all messages eventually arrive safely. Here are the three scenarios that could happen. The first scenario is that all except one lieutenant doesn't think it's a good idea to attack or becomes a traitor. That lieutenant then sends messages to the other three to retreat and the other two lieutenants will send messages that they agree to attack. At the end of this day of collecting messages, three out of four will have collected messages which say attack, retreat, attack. And the one lieutenant who doesn't agree will have collected attack, attack, attack. The majority here agrees that they should attack, although they are weaker by one lieutenant. Nevertheless, they came to a synchronized plan, and the first scenario ends in a success. The second scenario is that two lieutenants don't agree and say retreat. At the end of the day of collecting messages, the two of them will have attack, attack, retreat, and the other two who agree to attack will have attack, retreat, retreat. Every one of them thinks the majority agrees, but in reality, they don't. In this scenario, the army becomes desynchronized and they fail. This is basically the core of the problem. It's hard for decentralized systems to solve and continue operating smoothly if the majority do not agree on a synchronized state. They can only solve this problem in an uncertain manner involving probabilities. The magic number is at least more than two thirds of the majority should be truthful. This is why decentralization is important. The more decentralized you are, the more resistance the system has to this type of failure. If a system can solve this problem consistently with a high probability, then you can say it has high Byzantine fault tolerance. For the final scenario, if the general himself is a traitor and sends the messages attack, not sure, and retreat to each of the lieutenants, then there will be no majority and they will all retreat as a failsafe agreed upon earlier. In this case, although no majority, they still came to a synchronized plan and lived another day. So, the summary of this story is that a blockchain protocol helps transfer critical or private information, helps share a transparent state of reality to all participants in the network, and helps maintain that that state of reality is true, as long as more than two-thirds of the majority are truthful participants. So to sum this all up, if the internet made sharing information easier, blockchains will make sharing of truthful information easier, or information that people can rely on. Many say that it will make sharing of money or value easier, which is true, but that is obvious, and it can be taken a step further than that. Blockchain will bring the complete digitization of everything. Let me explain. Going back to our story, we see that the protocol gets the armies to survive by encouraging them all to agree on whether the city is attackable or not attackable. The armies study and view the city's defenses from different angles. So, if they all agree that the city is attackable, then it must be attackable. If they all agree that the city is small, then the city is small. If they all agree that the sky is blue, then the sky is blue. If they all agree that a piece of paper has value, then a piece of paper has value. So when thinking about this deeper, this turns into more of a philosophical argument. If everyone agrees that something is true, does that make it true? What if the sky is actually brown, but everyone agrees the sky is blue? Does it make it blue and not brown? Does society create their own reality in this case? Maybe blue is just the word we give to what really is in fact brown. I don't know, and this is probably going too deep into it, but the way I see it is that blockchain is a trust-based system which we can use to coordinate society better and represent the finite world in a digital form. Things like money in your bank, shoes in your closet, petrol in your car, or recording your first love song. Yes, you can recreate all this in a digital form through VR or sensors or some API, but when someone tries to hack this and add three cars to their garage, you're going to be feeling a little envious. These things are meant to be scarce and finite. With blockchain, there is always a single, shared, agreed upon reality of things. If there is one car in your garage, there is one car. 
You can't hack and add three cars as everyone agrees and knows that you only have one car. So it will allow more efficient transfer of information that people can rely on and become the trust layer of the internet. We are so lucky to witness the beginning of this new technology. The ways it will change our world will be so profound, allowing new ways to interact with each other and new business models not possible before. It will unlock more wealth than any other revolution before it, and we will look back on this day and really think it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Okay, so moving on, what is the valuable and truthful information that people rely on? Well, the obvious one is anything to do with money. So think banks, companies, factories, investments, mortgages, goods, shipments, deliveries, loans, power plants, marketplaces, royalties, copyrights, insurance, the list goes on. Another is private or critical data. So think personal information, health records, hospitals, schools, banks, universities, emails, voting, websites, passports, data centers, organizations. Now there is more, but we see the most demand from these sectors currently. If we look at the top five here, we get general money slash value, the public sector, and media and entertainment. Compared to the internet, we see that demand for blockchain comes from disrupting sectors which are relatively untouched by the internet, such as banking and government. So, how will blockchain make these sectors more efficient? Well, this is where it doesn't get so obvious. Even with the internet, when email first came out, people didn't instantly see the benefits. They thought, well, I have a phone and I can just see you in person. Why would I need to write an email? And even though we've gotten smarter since then and know there are opportunities with blockchain, it is still not so obvious to spot the benefits of blockchain. It's even harder than with the internet, in fact. You see, with the internet, you could physically see how it would benefit us. You can clearly see how an email would benefit someone as now they didn't need to go to the post office or use a fax machine. You can clearly see how it made it easier to learn, as now all sorts of information was instantly available on your desk. But with blockchain, how will it make banking or government more efficient? It's not so obvious here, as many of the inefficiencies today in these sectors are things that are not openly shared or known to people. This is fair enough, as we know that they handle sensitive and valuable information. Why would they openly share their practices with everyone? For example, how will blockchain make bank payments more efficient? I can already send money online through PayPal, and it happens instantly, right? Why would using blockchain make it any better? So this is where it gets challenging. You need to be familiar with how these sectors work to get a full view of the opportunities with blockchain. Now, I wish I could go through all of it here, but this will take time and will most likely be a new series on this channel. This series will go through the inefficiencies in these existing markets. But if you were to take away one thing from this video, it is that blockchains will make things more efficient by replacing the existing trust layer. So basically replacing middlemen. Today we see that middlemen are very useful and help society by being trusted and authoritative third parties. But this is also a source of inefficiencies. Blockchain will help us be more peer-to-peer -peer and more real-time. Now, at the end of every of these videos, I recommend a couple projects which seem to have the characteristics we find in our research. What we found today is that banking and government seem to be two big sectors that will be disrupted. So here are a couple projects which are currently in these sectors. Now, we try not to be biased on this channel, and we are only interested in the facts. Some projects have not been included due to lack of focus on these sectors and concerns over scalability. And some projects keep showing up again and again. Now, we do want to explore and give spotlight to other projects. But if the same projects keep showing up again and again, the unemotional conclusion is that there is something interesting going on with these projects. These projects we have covered before, they all have a focus on banking and government, and they each solve a very specific problem within them. The other projects which seem to be interesting are 
Avalanche, Ontology, and Polymath. Avalanche is aiming to be the go-to blockchain for DeFi. They use new consensus mechanisms developed in 2018, known as the Snow Protocol family. This seems to allow Avalanche high scalability, reaching speeds of over 4,500 transactions per second, whilst still maintaining decentralization and security. The project is specifically focused on financial applications, and even though their mainnet released in September 2020, they have already an impressive list of projects and partnerships. Their focus is on the DeFi space, including open source projects, and also large institutions. Under NDAs, we see that they have proposed and conducted projects with large existing organizations in finance. Another interesting thing about Avalanche is that their protocol has interoperability built in and is fully interoperable with any existing Ethereum project. They are positioning themselves well here as Ethereum is the big player in DeFi at the moment and we all know the issues Ethereum faces with high variable fees and scalability. What's more, this interoperability extends to any blockchain, not only Ethereum. This is definitely a project to watch. Ontology is an interesting project. They focus on digital identity, which has a lot of potential. You see, the thing we are missing in the crypto space is that the mass public is still not connected in any way to blockchains today. Once companies and applications are built on blockchain and become a normal thing, there needs to be some sort of way to connect your own identity to the network. Digital licenses are a current use case being explored with Ontology. This is with Daimler, the massive automotive company. With this digital license, you will be able to unlock your car with your digital identity. You can store data about your drive privately and sell it to other blockchains and companies, such as your miles driven with a blockchain-based insurance company. Maybe even earn carbon credits by driving less and then even lend your car out to other people on the network. There are a lot of use cases here, but the idea is that you will carry your identity and store slash transfer your private data across the different businesses and organizations. The only thing that comes into question is that ONT is based in China. China is openly not a fan of cryptocurrency. They are much more likely to build their own government-based blockchain. So any public blockchain in China comes into question here. Another thing to note is that dealing with identities means you need really strong ties with the government. This is something that is very hard to do in any country. Polymath is in the digital security space. This is a space we've covered before on this channel in the Algorand video. Think of securities as an umbrella word to describe all types of stocks, bonds, and derivatives. This is a massive space with potential $7 trillion worth waiting to be disrupted. The current problem in the market is that there are a lot of financial intermediaries. These intermediaries need to keep a ledger and manage each side of every securities transaction, therefore adding costs and inefficiencies to the market. Polymath is a blockchain that is specifically focused on digital securities. It will help organizations issue and manage their securities using the Polymath blockchain. This will replace a lot of the inefficient functions of intermediaries and therefore pass down cost savings to all users in the market. Polymath is also upgrading their blockchain to be built on Substrate, which is the software development kit by Polkadot. That was it guys, that's the end of the video. Thank you all very much for listening. If you made it to the end, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Um, also a big welcome to any new subscribers. A lot of people joined recently over the past week. So welcome everyone. Um, and yeah, thanks again for watching. If you like the video, hit the like button and subscribe. I make videos like this every week, looking at fundamentals in blockchain and digging deep into research. And yeah, I share this research with you so that we can make better long-term investments. So thanks again, and I'll see you next week.